There's this <clears throat> story in the Torah that's told. It's a very well-known story. Just two words. That's really changed the whole entire <clears throat> episode and how we view things. And what I want to take a look at today, <clears throat> in context of these two words in the story in the Torah, is the question of, well, attachment to outcome. We call it in, in, um, in Torah language, hishtadlus. It means every one of us knows that if you want to get something done, you can't just rely on Hashem. You have to actually go out and work. Hashem doesn't just give you a gift from above. What Hashem needs you to do is your part. He needs you to do hishtadlus, lehishtadel, to do your work, not to simply rely on God. He needs you to go out and operate and do things. The trouble is that whilst we speak about hishtadlus as really just something Hashem wants you to do, but it doesn't work that way often, practically. And instead of just doing it because Hashem said so, we are attached to the outcome. That means that to us, it becomes critical. If I succeed in doing this, then my life will be perfect and fine. And if I fail, God forbid, then I'm doomed. You see the attachment to the outcome? I must get this done. If I don't get this done, here's what can happen. But I want to take this to a real, a real life kind of situation that's going on by a lot of people today. And I'm going to just, you know, perhaps formulate what may be going on by people. I think the idea is that each one of us should take it to a space that we find ourselves in and ask ourselves the question for whatever position we're finding ourselves in. But I'm going to take an example. Let's say you are in the real estate market. <coughs> the real estate market is currently struggling, to say the least. I'm in the fundraising world, and you can see that people with real estate are not doing well. They're, um, they're, very, they're having a very difficult time right now. And so let's just say, what if you're in the real estate market? And what if you put significant sums of money into real estate, into buildings? And now you're very, very worried. Because what happens is, people in America, of course, buy things, not with money, but with credit. And the way to get credit, just like when they ask you about a credit card, is you just say that you earn such and such. And they give you the credit. Everything work, works well and fine until, God forbid, you can't pay the credit card. And then it could be considered a federal crime. That you took money that you weren't allowed to take. So you can get the credit without a problem. And so long as you pay back your credit card, it's all good. What happens if you did that with a building of $10 million? and you borrowed 10 million from the bank. <coughs> and now what happens is you must successfully cover that 10 million. So no one's buying the building right now from you because the value went down and uh, you can't fill it up or the tenants aren't paying because you live in New York and they don't have to pay and it's okay. And so what you're really worried about is not as much about losing the money which is in itself a real worry. But you also have a concern about falling into uh, prison. Because, right, if, uh, if you're caught and it's discovered what you just did, that was illegal and you could find yourself on the other side of the law. Not fun. So, what do you do now? What do you do if you're in extreme pressure and stress. Now just imagine what goes on in a person's head. There's always the past, the present, and the future. I look back at the past and I say to myself, why did I do something so ridiculous? You know, of course, when you did it, 
you were thinking to yourself, I have bitach and I trust Hashem, it's all going to be fine, and I'm doing things and it's a risk, it's a businessman's risk. Now you're looking back at what you did a couple of years ago, and you're regretting why you did it. And then you look at the future, and you worry about falling into prison, and losing your money, and your life and your family, etc., etc. And then you look at the present, and you're like, okay, it's true that right now everything's okay, but I'm not getting what I want, so therefore the past and the future are blocking me from being able to live the present. But it could also be that there's issues going on in the present, that you're struggling right now. Every day you're walking into work and struggling. So what I want to do is take a look at that. Now, into that space, put yourself in whatever issues you're going through. Worries about the past, regrets, <clears throat> concerns for the future, and how to deal with the present. That's really the question. Let's take a look at a story that takes place in the Chumash. What's fascinating about the story is that this is almost like a side detail of what goes on. Here's the story. There were a group of brothers who sold their brother. They sold Yosef. The siblings sold him. After they sold him, he goes down to Egypt, to Mitzrayim. And he went into the dungeon for 10 years, plus two, 12 years. But then he interprets the dream of Pari, and he becomes king. What was the interpretation of the dream? Well, that there was going to be seven years of famine, and everything would be lost, and the whole world would be in a state of famine. But Hashem was first going to give seven years of plenty. So the idea is that during the years of plenty, you gather everything you have, and then you'll be good for the years of famine afterwards, right? The years of plenty are wonderful, but they finish. And then begins the years of famine. Year one, people still have from before. Year two, now things become terrible. Now, here's the story as we know it. What happened then? Yaakov and his sons were living in the land of Canaan. And they didn't have food, right? Because there was a famine. So what do they do? Well, he says to them, guys, go down and get us food. Because in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, I hear there's food. So they go down to Mitzrayim and they come back. And the whole story with meeting Yosef unfolds, whereby they go back, they try to find Yosef. Once we're in Egypt already, let's try to find him. He accuses them of spying, sends them back. They come back with Binyamin. And then at the end, Yaakov ends up coming down to Mitzrayim as a result of that story. And they do tshuva and it's... It's, a, it's got a very happy ending. More happy than you could ever imagine. <coughs> I want to focus on that moment when the side detail happens. Why did the brothers go down to Mitzrayim? Why did they go down to get food? Did they have food or did they not have food? Study what it says, and you're correct. They actually did have food. What it seems to be is they didn't have food, so they went down to Mitzrayim to get food. The words in the Pasuk are, Yaakov lebanav, lama titra'u. Lama titra'u means, why are you portraying? Why are you pretending? Why are you showing yourselves as if you have food? But here's the story. If they didn't have food, then the question is not, why are you pretending? The question is, why don't you want to go down? We don't have food. We're going to starve. They didn't, he doesn't tell them we're going, we're going to starve. He says, Lama titra'u. Why are you showing? I don't want to use the word pretending. But what does it mean that they're showing themselves? So now, Rashi, who's looking at the actual translation of the words, has an explanation. He takes it from the Gemara in Tainis, but the Gemara actually says something different because Gemara is not designed to translate the words. The Gemara says that what Yaakov told them was, why are you allowing jealousy from the nations <coughs> to affect you? In other words, why would you want the nations to be jealous of you? That's the point. So people around are going to be jealous. The Gemara says, who's going to be jealous? Esau and Ishmael. Presumably why? Because Esau is always jealous of you. He hates you. 
And Yishmael also is going to be jealous of you. <coughs> and they didn't have food. So go down and get food. Rashi makes a whole different analysis of the story. And you'll see the reason he says so is because, well, because that's exactly what was going on. And that's what it says. Rashi says as follows. Lama taru atzmechem bifnei bnei Yishmaelu bnei Esav. Why are you showing yourselves in front of the Yishmaelites and the Esavites? Ke'ilu atem sveim as if you're satiated. Ki be'otah sha'a adayin haya lehem tfuah. At that time, they still had grain. How does Rashi know they still had grain? Because if not, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have been talking about, about how you show yourself. He would have been telling them, you need to go down because we don't have food. So the story is that actually they did have food. So now if you do have food, why are you going down? The reason you're going down is because lama titra'u. Why should other people think that um, that what? Ke'ilu atem sveim? Be'otah sha'ad? At that time they had food? What about tomorrow? Did they have enough food for tomorrow? Tomorrow meaning they had food for now. Do they have enough food for the future when they'll need it? The answer is Nope, they didn't. Because if, if the idea is that they had enough food at all, right? They had enough, enough food, okay? So it's all good. So then, then there's no reason at all to go down. Titra'u means that you don't have. You're pretending as if you have. So you, you, we were almost like stuck in the explanation. It must be they did have. Otherwise, you would have said, go down because you're starving. So no, you do have. And yet, you haven't really got enough for the future, which is why it's only what you're showing. So you're putting on a show that you have enough. You know what that means? It's talking about a situation. And this is where we can enter into their mindset. The sons of Yaakov had everything they needed for the moment. You're running a business? And right now, there's money coming in. It's all good. The funds are coming in. You're getting in the business deals. It's happening. It's good. The trouble is that you're concerned because you don't have enough tenants. And because tomorrow, if you don't, the bank might come tomorrow. It's a very likely scenario. And they'll demand their money back because you can't pay it. So now I'm good, but I'm actually not. We like to be in a space of having. We like to know that we have equity. Equity means security, right? We like to think we have security. It's very scary to us when we discover that we don't. On a collective level, that's what happened to us as a people lately. We realize there's real anti-Semitism, just like the Middle Ages, actually. So what do we do? We turn our heads away and we say, okay, but let's not, you know, let's, let's, let's just stay away from all that and live in a different space because it's too painful to live in this one. So we can just assume everything's fine, right? What happens? How do you live? and deal with the future and live the present when the present is scary. Very, not, sorry, not the present is scary. The present is okay. But just right behind the surface is a dark, scary, petrifying world of what could happen at any given moment. And if you look back at the past, regrets. If you look to the future, apprehension. What do you think the brothers were living? <coughs> There's no food. What does that mean, no food? That means that tomorrow we may end up starving to death. There's no worse death than starvation. Tomorrow we could starve. Not just us, our whole entire families, our children, everything we have. Which means all the wealth we have, 
the livestock, the real estate, everything will fall apart. It's an interesting world when you live and you're, you don't have like investments and all that. We think today we have, you know, we own things. One famine could take away everything you possibly have. That's where they're holding. And there's also the regret of the past, realizing that this may all be a punishment. Which is what the brothers actually said when they came in front of Yosef. They said, We are guilty for what we did. So they could feel guilt. They could feel sadness. They could feel despair. They could feel scared. They could feel everything of that. What did they actually feel? You know what they felt? Pitachon. They were perfectly fine. There were zero issues going on in their life at that time. So much so that they didn't feel there was any need to go down to Mitzrayim to purchase. They had money. They had the money. They just didn't have the, um, right, <coughs> The, the, the famine could destroy them. But they have money to go buy. So why don't you go buy? No reason. Why no reason? I'm good. I have everything I need. Want to try to live in that space? What would it look like if we could live in that space? Imagine if you put yourself in your space now and you say, every one of us has worries, right? It's not possible to be a human being and not have worries. If you are, you're just in a lull state. You're a little bit before it. It's coming, right? It's coming. <coughs> it's just a temporary state. But I think most people, certainly most people sitting here, most likely got issues, right? And the issues are very scary. But right now, you're sitting down, your life looks pretty okay right now, right? What do you do if things are okay now, but I'm really, 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 really scared and petrified of tomorrow? What we do is stress out and, well, our emotions go crazy inside, and then we do what's called histadlus. Well, I don't know if it's called histadlus, it's called going out and doing stuff. It's trying to do it. So stressing over things comes in the same place as us going out and making an attempt and trying and maybe I'm going to succeed and who knows. I'm going out and attaching myself to the outcome. Let's digress for a moment. What happens when things are difficult in the present? Here's an example. It's very nice that by them they had the food they needed. Yaakov and his sons had what they needed. But Yaakov's father and grandfather both experienced a famine, the same as Yaakov and his sons. <coughs> and in that famine, there was no food at all. Which is why Avram, what did he do during the famine? He went down to Mitzrayim. He went down to Egypt. And that's where the story where he tells Sarah, just say, I'm your, I'm your brother. And Pari took her away. That was a famine. Yitzchak had the same thing and he was going to Mitzrayim and Hashem said, no, 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 you can't leave the land of Israel. So he went to Gerar and that was where Avimelech wanted Rivka and the whole story which transpired over there. So it's very nice that the brothers didn't want to, didn't have to leave and they had what they needed but what about Avram and Yitzchak who didn't? It's fascinating to see what Rashi says. Rashi, when he talks about Yaakov telling his sons, what, what does he sell, tell them? He says, guys, what could happen is, why would you show yourself as if you have everything for the future? Who's going to get worried? Who's going to have questions? The sons of Yishmael and Esau. Very curious because Esau and Yishmael lived far away, actually in the south. And different commentaries explain what that means, why Rashi is concerned about them. Because the more likely concern is that the people around you are going to see that you have everything and they'll say, why do you have and we don't and get jealous of you? Those are the Canaanites. Esau and Ishmael did not live in Canaan. Some commentaries say that they were worried that Esau and Ishmael would maybe come past them on the way to Mitzrayim. <coughs> which is interesting because they actually lived closer to Mitzrayim 
than Yaakov and his sons. They wouldn't have to go north to go south. Why is the Gemara and Rashi saying? So the Gemara is saying it because, well, Esav was jealous all the time. That's why it puts Esav first, even though he was the next generation. Rashi says, Yishmol and Esav. He puts Yishmol first. Why? I'll tell you why. Because Yaakov tells them, his children, we don't have to worry about the jealousy of the nations around us. Why not? Because we don't care. That's why. If you start caring about what every nation in the world thinks, you can't live life. In other words, anti-Semitism is a fact of life. Don't worry about it. Just do your thing. What am I worried about? I'm worried about a legitimate concern of, ya- of Esav and Yishmoel. Here's the concern. Esav, Esav and Yishmoel both come from Yitzchak and Avram. Esav is the son of Yitzchak. He comes from Yitzchak and Avram. And Yishmoel is the son of Avram. They might have a legitimate concern. They'll say, how come Jews are so successful? Why are the Jews right now in a position that they have everything they need? We too are sons of Avraham and Yitzchak, respectively. So we also deserve it. And when there was a famine, what did Avraham and Yitzchak do? They left. So you also should be in that position to leave. So it's like it's a double hitter. The blessings should come to us. We deserve the blessings, right? As children of Avraham and Yitzchak. Number one. <coughs> and number two, Avram and Yitzchak left when there was an issue. So Yaakov tells his sons, he says, because of the Yishmaelites and the Esavites, their legitimate concern, that's why we need to worry about it. And you're like, one second. Why do you need to worry about it again? You don't have to worry about the nation's jealousy. But if these guys are going to have, a leg- the nations are jealous for no reason. But if these guys have a legitimate reason, Oh, that's why you got to worry about them. Because they're also sons of Abraham and Yitzchak. And they left. And they, right? So why, why aren't we wealthy? Why, it's a double hitter. We should also be wealthy because we come from Abraham and Yitzchak also. We deserve it as well. Yaakov is teaching his sons how to live life. Here's how you live life. Stop attaching yourself to the outcome. Number one. Step one. Step one is before we begin anything, look at yourself and say, am I really not okay? What's the worst, worst case scenario? What's going to happen? You lose the real estate deal. You fall into prison. Maybe your wife leaves you. Maybe your kids don't want to talk to you. How bad should we get it's pretty bad, right? You know what you got to do? Accept it. If that's what you're worried about, accept the disappointment. And all that will happen to you. And it's terrible, right? I'll still be alive. I'll still be okay. You see the problem? So long as... I need all those things out there. That's the issue. All I need is Hashem. It's not my fault. I didn't do anything. Hashem caused everything to happen. Look at Yosef. How bad could your life get? Well, what happens if your siblings sell you? And if they sell you (coughs) afterwards, what happens? You go to prison. You'll be in a dungeon for 12 years. And then what? And then you become king, but you're estranged from your family. Want that? Want that kind of life? What did the Yosef say? Everything that happens to him is like, okay, so I'm in a dungeon, so I'm going to be the chief of the dungeon. Okay, I'm a slave, chief slave. Okay, I'm a king, chief king. He's okay with everything that happens. It's such a, a counterintuitive way to live life. 
But you get that if you accept that, you have nothing more to worry about. Yosef could have sat down his whole life and looked back and saying, I did it to myself. I caused this. Because I went and told Lashon Hara about my brothers to my father and whatever, the whole story, that's why they hated me. All true. What does Yosef realize? I didn't do it. Hashem did it. And he accepts all the worst disappointments. The day you accept all the worst disappointments is the day of your freedom. It's so hard because you're like, whoa, if all that happens, I will be in an absolute space of, of, of that's horror. But if, if we accept that whatever Hashem does is good, then even if all that happens, I'm good. You know what just happens now? Freedom. Because when you're worried about all that coming about, you are enslaved to stopping it all from coming about. And secret, secret. You can't stop anything from happening. Whatever Hashem wants to happen will happen. So how about this? I sit in my space. And I accept that whatever Hashem decides to do is all absolutely good. Ain ra yoyred milamailo. No bad will ever come from above. If Hashem will do it, it will be good. I'm going to prison and I go down. It's all good. Ouch! But I accept it. You know how you accept it? You dream about the worst case scenario. You know, like you think about myself in prison and all, nobody there and I'm in whatever, and nobody wants to talk to me and I'm estranged or whatever. Go to that space. We love going to that space, right? We love thinking about all the negative things that could happen. It's very comforting. So think about it all and then go there and say, okay, and will Hashem still be my God? Yes. And once I can accept it, now I'm free. Free to be. And I accept the past for what it is. Now go to the brothers. They did the same thing. They looked at themselves. They said, we don't know what's happening tomorrow. It could be we'll fall into prison. Because, right, if, if we don't have food, we might end up, who knows what we might do, and they might, other people might steal from us. They might come. In those day, days, it wasn't much of an issue. The nations around us may decide to plunder us, and who knows what's going to happen. And, and they could have all the concerns in the world. What do they say? All good. Rashi says that in Parshas Vayishtach very clearly, when Shimon and Levi go to Shechem, he says, They were absolute betuchim. They relied on Hashem. Hashem, we, our father's Yaakov, everything's good. In the worst case scenario of what might happen and what already happened, they were relaxed. Now try that. Relax. Now what? Well, if I'm relaxed, I don't need to do anything. So I'm good. Yep. Exactly the point you want to reach. You don't need to do anything. Now that you accepted that, you're not attached to any outcome. You see, if I'm trying to stop something from happening or trying to make something happen, I'm going to be so stressed when I talk to other people, they'll feel all the stress all over me. The world will feel the stress and I'm going to block anything from happening. Now that it's all good, Yaakov tells them a fascinating point. He says, guys, how can you help the world around you? Let's look around the world and see what's going on. Look around. Well, there's these anti-Semites all around us who are jealous of us. Can we help that? Can we stop anti-Semitism? No. So that's not up to us. But I do see that there's Yishmael and Esav and grant to their anti-Semites. But right now I see they have a legitimate point. What's their point? that I get that Jews have an extra wealth. All the nations understand that. All the nations understand, right, that Hashem protects, protects Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov and their children more than anybody else. Yaakov says when he went to Lavan, right, he says, he says, Hashem, 
Hashem protects me. He's going to look after me in the middle of it all. And the more you, the more you do to me, by the more he was able to succeed. I can succeed in any situation. Look at the land of Israel today. The prosperity makes no sense. But it's amazing. It's wild. It's all Hashem. But Esav and Ishmael say, we're also children of Abraham and Yitzhak, so we also deserve that prosperity. Now, do I care what you say? I don't. I don't need to worry about you. But is there a way that I could stop this on your right now, your question right now? Is there a way? There is. What, what can I do right now? Remember, Avram and Yitzchak, their present was challenging. There was no food. So they left. Why did they leave? They left because they saw that Hashem wants me to go somewhere else. Because there's no food here. And they said, it's always working out for me. So even though Hashem sent me to this land, it's always working out for me. So if I see the presence not good and I'm forced to go, I'm like, okay, why? Well, because Hashem wants me to go. What's the reason? Hashem was testing Avram and later Yitzchak, the Medrash says. And he wanted to see, are you faithful to Hashem or not? So when you see you're forced to move places, accept that too is from Hashem. And when you see everything's good for you, like it was for the sons of Yaakov, ask yourself, is there anyone who I can help? And Yaakov says, well, if you stay home, these guys are going to have a question, how come you have and they don't? It's not fair. But if you go out to Mitzrayim and you also go get food, so they'll say, okay, so they also have to get food so they won't feel that jealousy in that sense. Ah, that you could help. See, it won't block the jealousy of the nations. It will block their jealousy. And so go out. Go. And they go. What you want to do is ask yourself a question. Everything's fine with me. I accepted the worst disappointment. Got it. I accept it. I'm saying that, right? But that's like probably the most difficult part in the world. Because to accept that I might lose everything is really, 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 really challenging. It's, um, you have to be a ninja to do that. You're going to be really, really, really good. It means you exercised your relationship with Hashem in the highest level possible. And it probably won't happen in one go. You're probably going to have to do it again and again and again and again to accept and to feel good. Because it's only going to work. You're not showing it to anybody else. It's for yourself. It's only going to work if you actually believe it. It means you can say, I'm good, I'm fine. But you're not, you'll feel the anxiety. And you have to accept the anxiety. You know something? The anxiety itself is a gift from Hashem. How do I know that? Because everything's from Hashem. That's how. So if I feel it, it must be Hashem gave it to me. So I'm sitting in a place right now and I'm like, okay, I'm trying to feel everything's good, but it's not. I'm feeling anxious. Okay, great. So now the anxiety is also from Hashem. Once you accept that, you go again and again and again and you allow yourself to feel good, you'll see you'll actually, it'll work. It takes time and constant effort to feel how Hashem is with you. Got that? Now, Hashem doesn't want you to sit at home and do nothing. He wants you to go out and do hishtadlus. Why am I doing hishtadlus? Not because I need anything. I'm not worried. I accept it already. That whatever happens is good. And Hashem will protect me and it's fine. Why am I doing it? Because there are things that need to be done that I can do. If I go out and get food from Mitzrayim, I realize B'nai Yisav and B'nai Shmuel won't be so upset. Okay, so let me go. Imagine you would do things and you're not attached to the outcome. You know, there's a big difference between apathy and bliss. People who have bitachin, trust in Hashem and everything's fine. So what it looks like you have is apathy. I don't need anything, so I'm fine. So I don't care. I don't need to do anything to prove any point. Right? But that could be misconstrued as apathy. Is it apathy? It's not apathy. It's bliss. Bliss means I'm in Hashem's presence. 
I'm good. I'm always in Hashem's presence. Everything's fine. So why am I going and acting and doing things out there? For one simple reason. The reason is because Hashem put me in this world and He wants me to go out and do stuff. That's why. Hashem wants it done. So look around the world and see what is it that needs to be done that I can do. If you're in real estate and there's buildings and there's potential tenants and whatever, you're going to call up tenants, you're going to call up real estate brokers, you're going to call up banks and you're going to do it. Why? Because clearly that's what Hashem put me in. That's what Hashem wants me to do. But I don't need anything. So I'm going to do my thing and head right back and not be attached to the outcome and not be scared. The people you talk to will sense that. When they sense a guy who's stressed out, they don't want to go near you because they're scared of what that may be. When they sense a guy who's just happy, they're like, wow, I want to be connected to that. See, Bitochen, Bitochen could lead us to arrogance. That's what's so strange and counterintuitive about it. When you trust in Hashem, what may happen to you is you say, I'm good. I accomplished this. I'm good. Everything's fine. If I'm good, I don't need to do anything. That leads to arrogance. See the problem? It could be arrogant because Hashem always takes care of me. What do you mean? So I'm fine. Hashem takes care of me. So Hashem says, in order that you should fully accept that it's me doing it and not you, what you need to do is go out into the world and accomplish it in the world. So the Jew goes out and starts to operate in the world. And you start looking for opportunities of what can I do to help and fix in the world. It's going to be in the arena of whatever you're occupied in. So if you have a problem in a relationship with someone, <coughs> that's your issue. You look at that person and you're like, okay, I got a relationship issue. Fine. It's okay if I lose this relationship. I want to accept. The only one I need a relationship with is Hashem. I'm okay with everything. I'm okay with losing my spouse and my children and my thing and everything. And it's like, I'm not really okay with it. I actually feel a lot of anxiety. But I'm going to be okay with it. <coughs> if Hashem wants it, I'm going to find all those feelings work through to be okay with wherever I am. And then I'm going to be nice to everyone for one simple reason. Because it's the right thing to do. That's what it means not to be attached to the outcome. If I get into a state of bliss, I can help people out there. That's what happened with the Yaakov and his sons. He tells them, you have everything you need. Yep. What does it mean you have everything you need? You have what you need for now. Because Hashem gave you a gift and you have trust in Hashem for the future. So if you got all that, the only reason to go out is lama titra'u. Those are the two words. Why would you like, make it look to the to the to Yaakov, to Esav and Ishmael, <coughs> Ishmael and Esav in Rashi's order, that everything's fine? You can help them. Go out to Mitzrayim and you'll help them. So when they went down to Mitzrayim, they didn't go down to get food, actually. Why'd they go down? So that Ishmael and Esav should see they're going down to get food. From their perspective, they absolute trust in Hashem. That's why the story ended up being so powerful. They thought they went down to get food. Had they been attached to the food, to getting the food all the time, and that would have been the biggest issue, the story wouldn't have happened. They went down because they trusted in Hashem. Hashem wants us to go get food. They didn't go get food. They actually went to get Yosef and to find Teshuvah and to find far greater things than they could ever have imagined. You see what happens when you trust in Hashem? Had they been attached to the outcome of food? They would have been looking, but are we getting the food or are we not? What? They wouldn't have been even thinking about that. There wouldn't have been a possibility for the dream of, of, of what should have happened to come about through them. Only because they let go totally. We don't need the food. Whatever Hashem does is good. So what Hashem brought down was a whole different world they could never even have imagined. Now, this applies to Jews in a different realm too. 
we Jews have the Torah, right? Torah is actually called bread. Just like there's bread in grain, there's Torah is called lechem, bread. The Greeks in the Hanukkah story attacked us. And the attack was a brilliant attack which hadn't happened till then. Until then, they were like Babylonians and whoever else attacked us then, Egyptians and whatever else was going on, all those in, in, in the Shoftim and everything. What was the attack? Destroy us, kill us. The Greeks were brilliant. They realized that what Jews like most is intellect. And, and you're fighting them and you're trying to kill them, but they're intellectual people. <coughs> so what they did was, they said, we'll give you all the intellect from alternative sources. You don't need the Torah. So they were brilliant Greeks. Chachme Atuna, the wise men of Athens. Ever heard of Aristotle, of Plato, of Socrates, of all those wonderful people over there. The philosophers. And they said, we're going to teach you wisdom. So you don't need the Torah. That's what it means in the Hanukkah story. They entered into the Beis HaMikdash and timu kol hashmanim They contaminated all the oil. Oil represents wisdom. They contaminated all the oil of the Jews. They said to the Jews, there's nothing, you don't need anything from Torah. You're trying to be, um, you're trying to be wise people. You want to be learned people, scholarly, cultural. All the things you want, we'll give you. It's like happens today, right? We assimilate into America because America's a good place. A lot of good people over here. What's wrong with Americanism? The Jews were looking for one thing when they came in. They found one jug of oil that had the stamp of approval of the Kohen Gadol. It should have been a stamp of approval of the Chachama Gadol, of the wisest man. It didn't have a wisest man of approval. What did it have? The holiest man. We Jews don't <coughs> learn intellect because it's intellectual. We learn intellect because it's divine. It's Hashem and us. Now here's the problem. When you live in this world, you learn intellect, you learn Torah, and it's great. You come to realize that the nations have a lot of wisdom too. Do we need the wisdom of the nations? A little bit. When you need medicine, you're going to a doctor, right? Torah tells you to go to a doctor. When you want to learn Kiddush uh, HaChodesh, you need astronomy. You want to go to astronomers and scientists and mathematicians to learn things. Of course we need the nations. We need to interact with them. Yaakov says to his sons, you don't need anything from anyone. Realize you have everything you need. Hashem gives it to you. That's the point here. Hashem gives you everything you need in life. Your parnasa does not come from bosses and from works and from real estate and from anything. It comes from you and Hashem. Only you and Hashem. It's a different way of living. The wisdom that you learn, everything you learn, you don't need anyone or anything. It's you and Hashem. You study Torah and you have everything in it. Nothing else needed. That's the point to accept. When It's interesting. Our, our Torah produces results. You know what like secular wisdom produces? Nothing. Nothing. Does it produce? Does secular wisdom produce produce men of morality? No. Nothing. What are the most immoral places in the United States of America? What, who are the worst of the worst right now in, in America? What are we, what, where, where is all anti-Semitism from? The universities, right? The academia. In, in Germany, it was thought, right, that the ac academic people will, will block Hitler. What ended up happening? They were the ones who encouraged it. It was all the academia that did it. Because academia doesn't produce piety. What does Jewish academia do? Produces piety. You know why? Because it's chatum bechotamosh el kohen gadol. Because we Jews produce results. We don't learn intellect. We're learning about Hashem. It's about how we draw Hashem down to the world. That's the question. So when I learn Torah, it's about me and Hashem, and it's all, I'm just learning how Hashem wants it to be drawn down. That's what it is.
That's why Yaakov and his sons are always protected by Hashem. When you're, in, when you're learning Torah, you always have what you need. When you have bitachon in Hashem, the same thing. Hashem will give you whatever you need. It produces results. Yes, actual, real, live results. Do I need anybody else? Nope, nobody else. Now that you've got it, you don't need them? Our wisdom has everything. Our parnasa is taken care of by Hashem. Everything is within <coughs> Hashem. Now what should you do? Hashem wants us to interact with the nations. So He wants you to go to a wise doctor to heal. Verapu Yerapu. He wants you to go to an engineer and an astronomer and an accountant and a lawyer and whatever else you So that the wisdom of Torah can spread across the world. Not because we need them, but because we want to spread our Torah out there. We don't work because we need money. Hashem takes care of us the whole way through. What do we work for? To spread the light of Hashem across the world. So it applies in every single arena of Jews. So now let's summarize. So we have the exercise and the work to do. Because it's very, very nice to learn it. It's hard work. There's two words in the Torah. Lama titra'u. Lama titra'u means we're talking <clears throat> to people who, number one, look at themselves and realize <clears throat> they have everything they need. <clears throat> if you don't have what you need, it's because Hashem wants you to do something else. You always have what you need. When Avram and Yitzchak are forced to leave, that's what you need to do. Leave. The sons of Yaakov look at themselves, look at yourself and say, <clears throat> I don't worry about the future. I don't care about the past. Whatever happens is good. I'm good with Hashem. It's always working out for me. Right? Say that on your life. Whatever's going on by you. All good. I am being taken care of and I accept that if Hashem's going to do something, it's fine. Because the day you accept that if Hashem does it, it's fine, then He'll make it good in a revealed way. The disappointments are because you don't accept them. If you accept them now, Hashem makes it good. I accept that. Now look around the world and say, Lama titra'u. I don't need the Greeks for anything. I am with Hashem. I need my Torah. I'm good. But Hashem wants me to interact with the world, to teach the world, to learn from them, to go out and use medicine and use all the powers of the world. Hashem wants me to go out and, and, and make money and do whatever I got to do and do the relationships. So if there's a relationship issue I have with someone, what's my work? I don't know. I'm good. If I'm good, what's the work? Well, this person feels upset because of me. Okay, so help them. Now it's no longer stress. I'm living in a state of bliss. When you're in bliss, you can really help people out there because you don't need it. When you're feeling good about it, you have all the power in the world to help. And so Yaakov tells his sons, you are good. Everything's wonderful. Everything in your life is perfect. And now you become a conduit to spreading <coughs> perfection all over. Because I don't, I'm not doing it so that I can gain something. I'm not getting anything from this. See that? I'm not gaining from this interaction. All that's happening is I'm channeling Hashem's energy down. When you start living that way, no stress, no worries. It's so calm. All that is is Lama so that you can help out the world with what you can accomplish out there.